So today, the war in Ukraine is at the center of our interest. The misery of the war is indescribable. The entire West sympathizes with a nation in danger of being crushed by a gigantic war machine commanded by a paranoid megalomaniac ruler. The war in Ukraine is not the first European military conflict after the Second World War. That deplorable status fell to the Yugoslavian Civil War. This week marks the 13th anniversary of the citizens of Bosnia-Herzegovina's vote for independence in a referendum. We remember the conflict that followed. We, were, we were remember Ratko Bladic, the general of the Bosnian Serb army, and Radovan Karacic, the political leader of the Bosnian Serbs. We remember the ethnic cleansing, the prison camps, and the massacres. The Dayton Treaty of 1995 ended the conflict, and in March 2016, Karacic was sentenced to 40 years in prison by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia for war crimes committed during the Bosnian Civil War. After that, public interest in Bosnia and Herzegovina died down. Media attention is impulsive and fickle. Media are focusing our attention like spotlights in the darkness that light up some issues and then some other issues, and then again some other issues, all in a flash. It is not because there is no public attention to the, the pressure to split the Federal Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina into the Federation of Bosnia and Her Herzegovina on the one side, and the Republic of Serbia on the other side has abated. As far as I understand, tensions are rising again. No one better to inform us about this than Peter van der Meer, Vermeers of LINES, which stands for Leuven International and European Studies of the Faculty of Social Sciences. So, and after his introduction, Anna Milosevic will offer a short reply on his exposition. Anna Milosevic is a researcher also affiliated with LINES, and her upcoming PhD thesis examines the impact of Europeanization on the politics of memory in the Western Balkans. Anna joins us from Italy. Fortunately, this can be done via Zoom. Because she does not speak Dutch, we will have this conversation in English. I give the floor to Peter. <coughs> Thank you well. Uh, good evening, everyone. And good evening, uh, Anna. Um, so, um, I, I, indeed, I will do the presentation mostly in English, but I will start with a short anecdote, I hope Anna forgives me, um, in Dutch. So, um, ik kom net terug van Bosnië-Herzegovina. Vorige week was ik in Sarajevo. En um, ik was daar om een burgerinitiatief um, te, mee te maken, om daar getuige van te zijn, om dat te kunnen observeren. En ik had dat al eens eerder gedaan, namelijk acht jaar terug, in 2014, uh, in februari 2014, toen er protesten waren in uh, Bosnië, uh, onder andere in Sarajevo, ook in enkele andere steden. Uh, en ik was daar om, om die protesten te zien, maar ook op het, om het burger, uh, de burgerrespons op die protesten te zien. Mensen kwamen samen in grote zalen om te bespreken hoe ze de toekomst anders wilden vormgeven. Het was een... Uh, een vleugje hoop in een donker politiek landschap, zou je kunnen zeggen, toen in 2014. En ik herinner mij, na zo'n hoopvolle avond van burgers die samen zaten in een grote zaal om de toekomst van het land te bespreken, dat de volgende ochtend de kranten vol stonden over Oekraïne, over het neerschieten van de Maidan-protesten. En ik zat vorige week in Sarajevo om een groot burgerinitiatief mee te maken, een baken van hoop in een nogal donker politiek landschap, en de kranten stonden vol van het nieuws over Oekraïne. En dat heeft hier zijn effect natuurlijk, maar het heeft in Sarajevo, in andere steden, in andere plekken in Bosnië-Herzegovina natuurlijk ook een bijzonder effect, een, een, een sterker effect. Want de herinneringen aan de oorlog komen naar boven 
Um, er is heel veel identificatie hier met het lot van Oekraïners op dit moment. Maar ik kan stellen dat eigenlijk in Bosnië nog die identificatie nog een heel stuk verder gaat. So, and I will continue in English so that Anna uh, understands. My purpose of today will be to um, give you a very brief introduction of the state of affairs in Bosnia-Herzegovina today. Um, and first of all, give you a bit of an idea of how the political uh, deadlock looks like, or what I will call an interlocking series of deadlocks. And, but in the second half of the presentation, I will also want to give you a, a glimpse of hope by um, telling you a little bit about the Citizens Initiative uh, that um, um, took place last week in uh, two cities in Sarajevo and Teslic. Um, to give you uh, a bit of a sense of what these interlocking deadlocks at this point are about, I need to give you a, a few words of intro, a bit of background on, uh, on Bosnia-Herzegovina. And here are a few facts that will help you to, um, to understand the picture. First of all, well, it's a small country, population of three uh, and a half million. That's smaller than a lot of cities. Uh, but at the same time, it has an extremely complex system of governance. And I've noted on this slide here that after um, the Dayton Peace Agreements, this system of government was established in order to create peace in the country. But it's extremely complicated, even for people coming from Belgium who are used to rather complicated systems of governance. This is, in fact, um, an, the next level, you could say. It goes beyond quite uh, that. And I've noted here, for example, there are 13 governments for a, a country of three and a half million people. That's quite amazing. Um, five presidents, so three presidents on the country level, and then each uh, for the entities, uh, each uh, a president that makes five presidents, and a total of 149 ministers. So that is quite a lot. So a very heavy um, system of governance. And I will not talk about every aspect of it because we could be talking about that for ages, but I will point out a few, um, a few problems uh, with that, apart from the problem that it is very big. Uh, I will talk a lot about the three-member presidency. So indeed, Bosnia doesn't have one president as a head of state, but it has three presidents at the same time in a sort of rotating system of chairmanship of the presidency. Um, these represent, these three presidents represent the three main ethnic groups or the constituent peoples, as they are called, of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So these are the Bosnian Serbs, the Bosnian Croats, and the Bosnian Bosniaks. We can talk about these ethnic differences or so-called ethnic differences later on. This is a complicated story in itself. Um, but so these presidents represent these three constituent peoples and there's um, uh, also a bicameral parliament. So two chamber parliament on the uh, federal level, so on the level of the state, consisting of a mix of proportional and ethnic representation. Um, now, of course, uh, this will also be recognizable for someone who comes from Belgium. Uh, there are all kinds of problems with the way the system functions and there are long delays in uh, government formation um, on all levels, you could say. Uh, on the level of the entity, so the parts of the federation, but even on the level of the local uh, um, governance, uh, so on the level of the municipalities. Most famously, the city of Mostar, uh, the city with the bridge, very famous. You see it on all pictures, on every uh, book on Bosnia. Uh, it's become a cliche in itself. But that city, Mostar, was uh, uh, for a long time, uh, for years, for more than 10 years, without a local government. Now it has a local government. But there are other challenges beyond this government system and how complex it is and how difficult all these, um, these little wheels are that have to interact with each other. There are also other challenges. There is a challenge, there's a challenge of emigration. So lots of young people want to go away from Bosnia and seek their uh, future elsewhere. There's a problem of corruption. There's a problem of an underperforming economy. Um, and also the continuous need of international overseeing of the country. There is still today uh, an uh, office of uh, a high representative. So 
meaning an international representative um, uh, responsible for some uh, elements of the governance of the country, so above, let's say, the level of the president and all the other state institutions. Um, there's a problem of divisive ethno-politics, meaning that uh, political parties are not only in the game uh, in the game of politics for the defense of their ideological preferences, uh, but also for in in the game of securing um, uh, a position in power for their own ethnic group, whatever that may mean. It usually means for their own membership and for the people of their own party. So you could say it's a partycracy uh, to a large extent. Also, this is somewhat known from the Belgian situation, but this is going much further. Um, and there's the issue of memory politics, and Anna Milosevic uh, has written a whole PhD on that uh, and is a specialist on memory politics in the Balkans at large. And so she'll probably respond to my talk with some notes on memory politics, so I won't say too much about that. But uh, as you can imagine, there um, is um, huge debates and problems with uh, how to remember the war. Um, so there's genocide denial. Uh, and there's glorification of war criminals, including those who are imprisoned. Right, so I will, in the next couple of slides, go a little bit deeper into this governance system. Um, I know this, is, uh, this will be mind-boggling for you, but don't worry. We need to know a few more things in order to come to the second part of my story, and that is the Citizens' Initiative. So. Okay, these are some slides I got from Radio Free Europe, uh, Radio Liberty, which uh, is a radio station that tries to explain Eastern Europe to a large extent, and they have some good um, uh, illustration material. This is a, um, a slide that explains to some extent um, the higher levels of governance in Bosnia, so the state level representation with the three member presidency, as you can see on the top. And so it has three dots here, the red, the blue, and the green dot. And it stands for Bosnia, Croat, and Serb. So there's elections every four years for the presidency. Uh, and people can directly vote the, uh, the president. The people in the Republika Srpska, one part of the country, they vote for the Serb president of the collective presidency. In the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, so the other part of the country, uh, there they vote for the Croat and the Serb member of, uh, sorry, the Croat and the Bosniak member of the, uh, the presidency. Important here is that you see the uh, red, blue, and green dot, but there's also in the upper line you see a yellow dot, and this says other nationalities. Of course, Bosnia doesn't consist only of people who identify as Serbs, Croats, or Bosniaks. You have also people who identify as Jewish, people who identify as Roma, and so on. Other minorities, other ethnic groups, and they are called in the constitution others. They are the other groups in society. One of the problems in the upper levels of state governance is that you can see here the red, blue, and uh, green dots, but no yellow dots, as you can see, so they are not represented. They're not represented in the presidency. They're also not represented in the bicameral parliament. So the bicameral parliament consists of a house of peoples, so Dom Naroda, as it's called, and house of representatives. So the house of representatives are elected territorially, directly from within these entities of the federation. The house of peoples are um, ethnic represent representations from the uh, um, entity level parliaments. So they send basically ethnic representatives to the federal level. And so you have five uh, Bosniaks, five Croats, and five Serbs sitting there on the statewide um, House of Peoples. And then you have the representatives, I'd say the ordinary uh, parliamentarians as we, as we know them here too, they're uh, represented in the House of Representatives. And then there's a, a council of minister with a prime minister and so on, but I won't talk too much about that. So the problem here is that you see there's no yellow dots. Then on the next slide, we go a level down. Uh, so this is the entity level um, system representation. So you have on the one hand, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So which is um, the red, uh, 
um, piece of the map, as you can see. Uh, and so it has its own parliamentary assembly, its own government, its own president, like I said. There you see some yellow dots. People uh, from these other groups are represented here in the House of Peoples as well. And same goes for the uh, parliament in uh, Republika Srpska. Then another thing to remember perhaps uh, in this whole complex uh, institutional uh, design is that um, the Republika Srpska is very centralized uh, in terms of the way it's governed, while the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina is decentralized. So it consists of several cantons, actually 10 cantons, and each of these cantons have their own governments. That's why you have so many governments in total. Now, these cantons are also a remnant of the Dayton peace agreements. Um, five of these cantons are majority Bosniak, three of these cantons are majority Croat, and then there's two that are in the middle, let's say. Um, so on this slide, you have uh, a view of these cantons in the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, and you also see a special district. So on top of that, they even have a special district, which is called Brčko, which is governed by the two entities at the same time, but has uh, some um, um, autonomy within um, the setup of the, of the um, federal state. Right, okay, so complicated story. Important here is, that there are interlocking deadlocks, as I have said, and there are many of them. And I could talk about lots of them, but I will single out three ones that are at this point uh, important in the discussion in the, the political crisis uh, that uh, Bosnia finds itself in. The first is the thing you've probably heard from the press, because this has been much in the press uh, in the, uh, at the end of um, 2021. Um, so the leader of the Republika Srpska and the member of the presidency, of the collective presidency for uh, the Serbs. So this is Milorad Dodik, a nationalist leader who um, is uh, the ruling politician in Republika Srpska, a member of the Alliance of Independent Social Democrats, the SNSD, and I'm mentioning this political party here because it's a bit odd to think of him as a social democrat, because he's mostly a nationalist politician. But this points to the fact that political ideology within political parties doesn't mean that much in Bosnia. Uh, it's mostly a, a game of ethnic representation. So Milorad Dodik has a program of separatism for Republika Srpska, gets sometimes support from this, or seeks support for this by international actors. He's good friends with Viktor Orban, his good friends, he says, he claims himself with uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, of course, there are all sorts of ties with Serbia. Um, Serbia, also an autocratic country, you could say at this point. Uh, and Vucic, the, the president of Serbia, um, maintains relations with Milorad Dodik as well. Although it seems that in, no in November, December, when the crisis was at its highest, when Milorad Dodik said, I'm going to pull out of the federal institutions that Vucic from Serbia was, seems to be uh, in the position of kind of um, mollifying or softening that position to some extent. But this is an important figure in the situation in which we are now, because Milorad Dodik claims we should reform the country to such an extent that um, the Republika Srpska becomes even more in, uh, independent that it is now, that it becomes independent, in fact. The second figure about which you may have not heard very much, but is equally important in the current crisis, is uh, a guy called Dragan Čović. So he's the chairman of another political party within the Federation of Bosnia and, and Herzegovina, a party uh, representing uh, the Croats, a Croat nationalist party, you could say. And he also doesn't agree with the institutional setup of the country, but for a different reason because he wants to revise the electoral law to secure the victory of his own party, the nationalist Croat uh, party, in the presidency um, uh, of Bosnia-Herzegovina as a country, so in the three-member presidency. You could say, why does he want to revise that? Well, the problem is, according to him, that the Croat member of the three-presidency is elected in the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
And also Bosniaks, so non-Croat Bosnians, Bosniaks can also vote for a Croat member of the presidency if they want, which they have done apparently in the previous election in 2018 when uh, Čović was a candidate, but a non-nationalist Croat candidate, Želko Komšić, uh, won this election and became one of the three presidents. So Drogan Čović says, well, this is not a good system. In fact, we should avoid that the Bosniaks could also vote for the Croat candidate for the presidency. So uh, we should abolish the system uh, or even think about creating an, a, a, an additional entity, uh, a Croat entity uh, or an a territorial Croat entity somehow um, as part of this already complex system. So complexify it even more. So that's the, 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 the second deadlock that I, that I want to present. The third one is um, also quite infamous. It's a ruling by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg done in 2009 on the constitution of Bosnia, on this complex system that I tried to explain. So there are two people who um, claim before the European Court of Human Rights that the system is in fact discriminatory. Um, the guys were called Sedic and Finci backgrounds, Roma and Jewish. Um, and the court, European court said, well, yes, you are right. There's an impossibility for people who do not identify with one of these three constituent peoples to become a candidate for the presidency. So it's not fair. Uh, there should be yellow dots, basically, uh, on, on this higher state level. That's what the European Court of Human Rights said. And so this, the system should be uh, reformed. Um, and this ruling is from 2009. As you can see, no response to that has been um, uh, accepted. Uh, there's endless political debate on that, obviously. Um, and um, so there's a need to reform that. Everyone agrees, but there's huge disagreement on how this reform should work. Um, on top of that, you know, uh, the dominance of the political class in election uh, is, of course, uh, strongly uh, um, viewed as negative by ordinary citizens who have a dis uh, distaste and a disgust of everything that has to do with party politics. But the paradox is that if you look at membership of political parties in Bosnia, that membership is quite high. So you see in all European countries that membership of political parties is dwindling. But in Bosnia, it remains quite high, and the answer is quite simply because people feel that they're dependent on these power structures that these political parties have formed. So if you want a job in a hospital or in school, it's best to have a membership card of a political party, maybe a couple of them, so it increases your chances for um, some economic prosperity. That's the situation we're in. People are disgusted by the, the, the political deadlock, uh, and at the same time, they're dependent on these politicians that run the show. Now, on top of that, of course, you have the international community who's also pushing for reforms, but it's very hard to get this done. Okay, so I can answer questions about uh, the more intricate parts of this uh, whole conundrum later on, but let's move on now to the second part of my story, which is the more hopeful story about how citizens respond to this. A citizens' assembly. So, what happened? Um, the initiative came from, a, from a several sources, let's say. Um, the European Union delegation in Bosnia, independent academics, uh, the OSCE, the Council of Europe, uh, the uh, ambassador uh, of the United States in Bosnia, various sources. The idea grew that uh, one way to get out of this political deadlock, deadlock, or at least to suggest some sort of solution, would be to um, neglect for a while all the political institutions that exist and organize a citizen's parliament. So as you've seen in one of these first slides, the federal parliament consists of 57 members. So the idea was, well, can we just not get 57 people from the population together as a sort of people's parliament and let them discuss the conundrum and see how far they come outside of the 
realm of political parties and all of that. And on top of that, apart from we'll just not ask their opinion, we will inform them. We will let them talk to uh, experts, to legal experts, to political scientists, to people from abroad, to anyone basically they want to give them enough information to, you know, to come to a conclusion which um, they think is the right uh, solution. So these 57 people were randomly selected from across the country. But basically, it means you have a very diverse group there, people from all age groups, people from various um, professional backgrounds. Uh, I spoke to a nurse from Brčko, a carpenter from Republika Srpska, people from, from various walks of life, let's say. Um, people also, obviously, from uh, different ethnic backgrounds, although I have to make a footnote here again with what does ethnic background mean. Many people live in mixed groups, mixed marriages, mixed families, mixed communities. Um, Bosniaks are supposedly um, Muslims, but very often um, uh, they're not practicing Muslims and faith is not uh, uh, very important to them. Um, and, the other, and for the other groups, uh, these cultural aspects of identification are to be put in perspective as well. So in any case, you bring these people together. Um, this was for two weekends, uh, very intense weekends in two places. One place in the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, one place in the Republika Srpska, uh, so Sarajevo and Teslic. And you let them discuss this question about the discriminatory provisions in the constitutions, because that's the basic question here where it all starts. You know, we start from the yellow dots that are not present there, and on that basis, what would you recommend, how would you reform uh, the system? The discussion was really fully inclusive in a sense that um, uh, people, everyone, basically had to have an opinion at the end of the, of the two weekends, so there were all sorts of group techniques, uh, used for that, con conversations in small groups, bigger groups, plenary sessions, then again in small groups. So even the most shy people would be invited to form their opinion, and even the most dominant people in the discussion would be invited to tone down their opinion and to think twice about what they were already thinking. Um, then, of course, uh, people were invited to talk to these people, stakeholders, including representatives of political parties, were invited to present their perspective yet again to these groups, and uh, so to make sure that everyone understood really well what um, the issue was. And there were in-depth discussions, and I must say, seeing this as an outsider is quite heartwarming uh, because it is so impressive that when you bring people together from different sides, they start quite quickly to form a group in themselves. So they identify not with their ethnic background or political party, but with the group in which they are. And they are pushed, they feel pushed to come up with decent solutions. Um, it's very intense for an intensive to, to be part of such a, such a group and to go through that, through that process. And I think for lots of these people, it's a life-changing experience in a sense that they become more engaged and committed to uh, political ideas than they were before. And they're, suddenly they have the feeling like, okay, politics is not only this disgusting game of trying to please your own personal interests. It can be about how to organize a country better than the way it is organized now. And you can see it, you know, people are maybe a little bit hesitant in the beginning, but after a while, they are really into the discussion and it's fascinating to see how quickly a group of randomly selected citizens becomes a group of interested political scientists, basically, designing a new, new ideas for, for the country. Um, also, personal stories, of course, come up in these meetings. Really at the, the first plenary session, when there had been already a bit of group discussions and warm-ups and all of that, um, there was a plenary session when the facilitator asked, well, does anyone want to share experiences or does anyone have a question? Suddenly this guy um, stood up and said, yes, I don't have a question for the moment, but I just want to share with you of just a story. Um, because I was coming into this group, people that I haven't you know, seen before. I was very curious about this one person who I seemed to recognize. I didn't know from where. 
Uh, this was a guy in his 60s, I, I suppose. And suddenly he get to, they, these two persons uh, get to talk to each other and then they discover that they knew each other from childhood, that they had been in the same village during their, their, their um, uh, young years. But of course, the war had interrupted um, the childhood or the situation when they were young. So the village was split and they had ended on different sides of the war, had lost a track of each other, had never thought of each other uh, uh, anymore, and then discovered that they knew each other there at this um, citizens' assembly. What are the odds, you can think, but also what a beautiful story that suddenly, and of course these guys were constantly together in between in the breaks talking about, you know, what, did, what happened in your life and what happened in my life and all of that. So that's sort of the beautiful background story that you get in, in, the, in gatherings like that. They came up in the end with 17 recommendations. Agreed unanimously or almost unanimously uh, with large majorities and these is very hot news because actually this, the press release on that in Bosnia is coming out today. Um, so I can give you a, a bit of a, uh, you know, a scoop on that, on what these recommendations exactly are, or at least in which direction they go. And a couple of things uh, that are interesting to observe here. First of all, uh, it's clear that the directions go in, or the recommendations go in the direction of more integration. So less ethnic representation, but more representation of a diverse community. So away from the consociational, as political scientists call it, the consociational deal uh, that was made to end the war. And consociational deal means agreements between ethnic elites in order to please these ethnic elites that they have their interests represented on the, uh, in these state institutions. So what they basically wanted to suggest was, well, we can get rid of a couple of these uh, institutions. For example, the uh, uh, People's um, um, Chamber, so the, the House of Peoples, the Dom Naroda, on the federal level, but also on the level of the entities, perhaps we should abolish that um, and, in, and not have this ethnic representative there. Um, so that's one of the recommendations. Another recommendation is to change the presidency. And there have a couple of ideas that go in different directions. One is to have a fourth president. Uh, but then, yes, well, one, one person suggested maybe we should have a football team of presidents, <laughs> which was not a bad idea, I think, for a country that loves football. But um, yes, but a fourth presidency, but a much less powerful presidency, um, which would be not directly elected, but would emanate from uh, the parliament and then uh, would not have such uh, a powerful um, 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 uh, competencies as uh, the head of state. So recommendations going in these directions, but also recommendations very, which were out, a little bit outside of the remit of this original questions, recommendations on um, how to deal with fraud and corruption. How can we make the system better, the electoral system, so that we are sure as citizens that there is not uh, electoral fraud and that uh, the corruption is, um, uh, you know, uh, dealt with in a, in a decent way. Also a recommendation that political education, they found their own experience quite marvelous because they got a chance of getting to know how their own country functions. And they said, well, we should actually make sure that the state has more opportunities for, um, for, political, for political education. Um, and uh, this falls a little bit out of the remit, but it shows you that the experience of a, a citizens' assembly is so profound that people think and believe that this is a, a, a practical, but also a useful way of doing politics in a different way, and that there actually can be um, gains to be made for everyone, not only the ordinary citizen, but even the politicians. Now, what will happen with these recommendations? Obviously, there my hopeful story a little bit dissolves once again, because this will be presented to the existing parliament uh, on the federal level, and it will be strongly pushed by the international community. And probably, the, not only the recommendations will be strongly pushed, but also the method of doing politics, the method of informing the institutions about the preferences of the citizens will also be 
uh, on the agenda of such a uh, meeting. Now, of course, here comes the weak chain, or the weak part of the chain, of course. What will uh, the, the politics, uh, the political system and the people who are in that political system, what will they do with it and where will it lead to? It's hard to say because they have a vested interest, of course, in blocking the system more in order, at least some of them, in order to um, cement their position in power. So um, it, it will be an interesting space to watch uh, in any case. Uh, as a um, uh, political scientist, I would be interested to see in which direction it goes and whether there will be some steps, maybe modest steps towards introducing some level of deliberative democracy with direct in input of citizens within this uh, system, whether the system will perhaps simplify a little bit, be simplified, or even be made more complex. That will be very interesting and fascinating to watch and to follow, as I said, as a, as a political scientist. As a, um, a friend of the country, let's say, someone who likes to travel there and who has many friends there, and uh, it's a beautiful place, I'm, of course, um, you know, not only interested and intrigued, but also worried and, and hopeful and all of these, the mix of emotions that you can have uh, around it, because I do hope that it will go in the, in the right direction. Um, so, this is my 20 minutes time, I believe I went a little bit over. Yes. A little bit over, okay, sorry. And I, I will give the floor to Anna Milosevic, who uh, I hope is still there and has, has been able to follow my, my talk to add a few words on that? Um, so thank you, Peter, for uh, this very, very detailed um, presentation about the current and the past situation in which Bosnia and Herzegovina has been so far. I think it's uh, quite informative, and I thank you also for pre presenting all these kind of new developments in Bosnia and Herzegovina that kind of, um, I think, uh, give us a glimpse of hope that things can uh, somehow change in Bosnia, and then we can go up from these uh, deadlocks, um, as you say. Um, I'm also uh, very sorry that, like, um, Helen Tokek, who is one of the major experts on Bosnia and Herzegovina in Belgium, is not present today because I'm sure that, like, she would have uh, uh, maybe more detailed and more appropriate answer to what you have just uh, presented today. But I'm going to try to pitch in uh, with some of the uh, ideas uh, I have uh, on this. And mainly what I wanted to talk about in this uh, <laughs> five minutes that I have, very, very briefly, is to um, maybe uh, redirect your attention to what has been going on two days ago in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and namely on the 1st of March, uh, there was the uh, Independence Day in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So in 1992, when Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, claimed their own independence from, the, from Yugoslavia at, at the time, they were quickly recognized by the European uh, member states. And then uh, after that, uh, they also got recognized by the United States and Two months later, they become the members of United Nations. So why is this important? Because on the 1st of March, two days ago, uh, may I remind you, uh, there was this feeling in the country uh, that some people were uh, celebrating the Independence Day and some people were commemorating uh, the Independence Day. Why this difference is important? Because uh, of this cage of ethnicity that the Bosnian and Herzegovina is actually living, meaning that most of the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the 1st of March, they were celebrating their independence, and that day was commemorated uh, publicly, uh, also by going to the uh, grave of murdered children during the 92, 19, uh, 1995 war. Meanwhile, in Republika Srpska, that day was just day as any, any, any other day. So what this cage of ethnicity actually means for Bosnia and Herzegovina, it means that there is this major deadlock, as Peter said, between the Dayton and Brussels currently, but also between the neighbors, between Serbia and Croatia, who have a really, really important role to play 
um, in the past, but also in the future of the country, I would say. And this cage of ethnicity also means that there is a deadlock somewhere between genocide denial and glorification of war crimes and war criminals as well. And if I may point out as well, uh, the current situation, the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine in this period and how this uh, plays out in the region and more specifically in the, in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, I think it um, can teach us a number of lessons about the general sentiment uh, that is uh, now uh, currently lived in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is the one of reactivating all those memories of the 1990s and uh, the people's memories of those moments when they also felt um, invaded and they also felt that their lives are, are, um, are in question. And in that spe specific moment when the Bosnia was living this kind of similar and also uh, uh, comparable uh, situation comparable to Ukraine, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina kind of felt hostage to international political interests. And this is something that is um, quite, quite a uh, strong feeling um, uh, in, in Bosnia, in Bosnia Herzegovina in, in these days, um, because a lot of people felt betrayed by the international political, uh, political interests. And if we think about those moments when the Bosnia actually pronounced its own independence, which was 30 years ago, uh, then we have to also think about um, how this whole process of international community, so to say, uh, intervention in Bosnia and Herzegovina actually uh, went along and what are the consequences and what are the results of, um, of these actions. So we find ourselves again in this deadlock, as, uh, as, as Peter said, that we are confronted with uh, creating new solutions and using the Bosnia Herzegovina again as a sort of a laboratory of democratic experience, which is also something that Peter mentioned in the second part of his presentation, having this kind of democratic parliaments where you have some kind of a randomly chosen um, members of a jury, like in a criminal proceedings, uh, where they are invited uh, despite their backgrounds and you know, regardless of who they are and uh, what they have been doing in their lives, they're sort, sort of invited as a members of a jury to decide about the political future. So this is also one sort of experiment that maybe can be very, very beneficial uh, to the future of Bosnia and Herzegovina because it is something bold, it is something interesting, it is something new um, that hasn't been tried so far. But when you are 30 years in a deadlock, whereby the international community that was there to sort of provide uh, intervention into the conflict that was going on uh, in the country and in the region, and you see that that kind of intervention did not produce any kind of results, then you are also obliged to try to do something else. And what I mean by that, that intervention into the Bosnia and Herzegovina um, did not function, um, what I mean by that is actually, and pardon my <laughs> metaphor, is that Bosnia and Herzegovina is often seen like by international experts in uh, foreign policy, international relations, and as some sort of an orphan child. And that orphan child is considered to be bipolar. So on the one hand, you have different kind of entities within the country, as Peter so eloquently explained in, in his presentation. And these kind of different personalities of one child are being taught about their future by different parents. So this creates a lot of a lot of confusion, and it has also um, brought us to a moment where actually the people, the citizens of the country, they have no ownership of their own democratic process, and they have no ownership of the reconciliation process, which has been um, deemed as something really important and really crucial, and also in relation to the European future, um, European future of the country. So this kind of 
interventions that the international, so-called international community, and also the European Union in particular, have tried to implement in the country. And this kind of process actually gave a really uh, confusing um, kind, of, kind of results. Uh, we can also say that the European integration process, when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, has been untransformative. It has been untransformative because it went on from actually uh, intervening into the um, memory politics as well uh, of the country, uh, not to talk about the democratic and political processes, instead of actually assisting what is supposed to be the bottom up, uh, I think, um, answer that has to come uh, from the citizens themselves. Okay. So um, I think I can I can finish here yep, and maybe uh, just uh, hear out some comments or questions for Peter or for myself. I think <clears> it will be uh, more useful at this point. Uh, indeed, you. thank you very much. I, I suppose that some people have some questions, and now you have the the, the possibility to ask the questions to uh, Peter or and you can <coughs> ask them in in Dutch as well, or uh, so you don't need to. Uh, yeah, Peter, ask him in English. he can Netherlands speak in Yeah, well, <laughs> keep yeah. Keep know, we can, you can ask him in Serbian too. <laughs> Serbsky is also okay. good. Uh, there are two questions, yeah, <clears throat> please. <laughs> yeah, given that this was a, a newly independent country, this government structure that was then designed could, I presume, be designed from scratch. Uh, did the people who designed this not realize that? Uh, this was a bit overly complicated and prone to all kinds of uh, deadlocks and abuses. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, was this really the best that the political scientists of the world could come up with for this particular country and people? <laughs> or was it designed uh, so as not to work uh, <laughs> because of forces that exerted their influence on maybe well-meaning uh, technocrats who know how to design a government but probably could not just do it on their own. Uh, so wh what's the reason why it's, it ended up like this and did no one realize this was not going to end well? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe I can answer it. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it wasn't meant to not work, but it was meant to work, but to do something very specific and this to end the conflict. So it, uh, there are pictures of the Dayton uh, negotiations where they designed the, more or less the complex structure that I presented and it was drawn on a napkin really like very quickly you have pictures of that it's really improvisation like do you agree with that no okay we'll, we'll redesign it and in the end everyone agreed like this is okay but what should have happened immediately after 95 is um, a transformation of the system in a, in a deeper way to in, introduce more integrate, integrative uh, elements in it and go away from that consociational model. Uh, and they could have done uh, citizens' assemblies like the one I presented really, really immediately uh, uh, after the war, but they didn't do that. Um, the strategy of the international community was more or less one of appeasement, one of, well, at least there's no war now, so that's a step up. That's better than uh, um, we used to have. It's not perfect yet, but we'll let the, the politicians who are now in charge do it themselves. And they, of course, continued the logic and the reasoning that was behind the Dayton Accords, which is the reasoning of ethnic division and uh, the, the logic, basically, of the, of the, of the conflict. So it was a prolongation of the conflict with other means, you could say, and not the establishment of a functioning state. And that's why it's become such a, such a complex system. And um, I think the international community realized later on that uh, the strategy of sort of appeasing all these political leaders would not uh, lead to any sort of solution uh, and would only prolong the, um, the, the different deadlocks that are um, apparent in the system. Okay, thank so you. I think that, that's, the, that's the, the answer. Yeah. Thank you very much for your um, uh, introduction. Um, it was very depressing for me uh, because um, I've been from 1906 to 
2004 International Commissioner for Real Property in Bosnia and Herzegovina under the Dayton Agreements, uh, Chapter 7. Uh, I've been there from the very beginning when Sarajevo was still burning. Um, in the beginning, the idea was to cre recreate the multi ethnic society Tito had realized, and you have those intermarriages, which were also a political um, aim of Tito, you know, to, to have uh, interracial or interethnic marriages uh, just to consolidate Yugoslavia. Uh, but very easily and very quickly, uh, this idea uh, proved not to be feasible. And let's say when I think of the work we had to do, initially we were supposed to promote the return of uh, um, two million refugees and displaced persons to their homes. But in a country with ethical cleansing, uh, this is impossible. And what, in fact, what we did is separate the society and make it uh, ethnical clusters instead of this multi-ethnic society. Then with regard to the co constitution, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the great uh, inspiration for the Bosnian constitution came from Belgium. And our Leuven colleague, André Aale, has played a crucial role in the federalism of uh, Bosnia. Um, of course, it didn't work. It didn't work when we were there, and, uh, and it doesn't work nowadays. Um, indeed, when you are working in a team, and uh, in our commission we had uh, Croats, Serbs, uh, uh, Bosnaks, uh, and they really got along, some more or less, some were really nerds, some were bastards, but some were very good people. Uh, and let's say I think very fondly of uh, uh, the Bosnian uh, judge and a Serb uh, a public prosecutor um, who were together in the court of Sarajevo and were colleagues, and there was a very close link between the Bosniaks, uh, the Bosnian representative and the Serb representative. But the real problem is when you then have to go to the outside world. And I now I admire your, your initiative, which is, uh, reminds me of my initiative. David von Rijbroek. It is the EU's initiative. <laughs> and of course, if they, you bring together people, now they, they are of goodwill and common sense. And if you explain to them things, now they, they will reach a decision, especially when they are lodged and uh, fed uh, during that weekend. But the real problem is what to do afterwards, because we were unable to change the political system. We were unable to change the mentality, corruption, uh, parochialism, uh, whatever. Uh, an an okay. extreme uh, consciousness of the history. Uh, the Serbs is the only uh, population I know which has as a national holiday um, a battle which they lost. Okay, uh, perhaps a reaction because that was reaction, not really yes. a question. Well, um, so um, yes, well, the, the attempt was to divide um, or to govern Bosnia in in uh, through ethnic clusters, as you describe it, and obviously that stands far away from how the ordinary people feel their attachment to the country. Uh, there's a lot of mixing and intermixing and mutual identification among Bosnians. It was so before the war, it was a little bit less perhaps right after the war because of the war, but then even today now you look at it and it's actually quite a strong identification with uh, a common Bosnian identity for the whole country in, a lots, of, in lots of places, also among the Serb population. Um, there's there's a fantastic joke, uh, the Bosnians like to tell jokes, the fantastic jokes, but I'm the child of a mixed marriage. My father is a man and my mother is a woman, so that's a, a form of mixing already. Um, but in fact, if you look at it ethnically, so the ethnic identity doesn't mean necessarily that much for ordinary Bosnians. The problem is that the logic of state governance is purely built on that ethnic, um, uh, ethnic idea. And so you run into problems after a while. Um, and it's a missed chance, a missed opportunity, I think, to not experiment more with transformation of the system uh, early on in the 90s when the conflict was over, when there was more optimism among the, the Bosnian population than there is now. Um, the glimpse of hope that I presented here is that when you do this kind of experiment, much too late and uh, in very difficult circumstances, 
you still see that people are committed to the process and come up with creative solutions that actually are meaningful and make sense because the introduction of these in more integrative elements in a purely consociational system, this is what political scientists are studying all the time in, in, in a divisive, deeply divided, so-called deeply divided societies and are seeing very good results of when that happens. But you only have to convince, of course, the political class to take these very good recommendations seriously and um, implement them and not go, not, you know, go for their own power position. Um, unfortunately, democracy is a very fragile um, thing. It really is um, fragile because of the fact that once you have a power position in a system that is dysfunctional, you might, as uh, a politician, choose for the dysfunction because you cement your power. Okay. But along the way, you lose your country, of course. Yeah, perhaps, uh, <clears throat> perhaps Anna wanted all, wants also to react on the discussion now, or uh, do you just follow? I think. Uh, can you repeat the question? Because I uh, perhaps yeah, perhaps you, you have followed. <laughs> so you have followed the discussion. Perhaps you want to uh, also react on what has been said. <clears throat> you you have no commands. Well, no. Well, I agree with Peter that, you know, like the, one of the major problems is that there is this kind of uh, cage of ethnicity that is um, practically imposed uh, politically on the societies and societies react actually differently. And also when you look at uh, also the grassroots citizens initiatives, whether we are talking about uh, individuals, whether we are talking about like-minded individuals or some sort of a local local initiatives when they are doing something that uh, pertains that also goes in the direction of peace of uh, cross ethnic uh, dialogue communication working together um, these kind of citizens initiatives are being discarded uh, by by the politicians because they do not play in their hands so they do not go into this favor of you know, like creating this ethnical divide or living within this kind of enclave of uh, ethnically confided communities. So, uh, um, of course, there is a abyss uh, between the citizens, actually, and the politics mm -hmm. in the ways in which they interpret citizenship, in the ways, ways in which they interpret belonging to a country, to a local community that um, is quite, quite, quite different, actually, uh, between the politics and the way the society uh, actually reacts and lives uh, reality on the ground. Yeah, the, the whole discussion reminds me a little of um, the approach of um, Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau was quite convinced that if we want to have um, decent laws, we need to start from the general will, not, not the particular interests. And so to reach the kind of position where people are prepared to see what is of common interest and of what is of public uh, reward, that, that seems to be the whole uh, the issue. And so that kind of new way of, of let ordinary people come together and discuss these kinds of things, automatically they are thinking from what would be good from a more common perspective, from that kind of general will perspective. That seems to be still the, uh, a variable. And having 149 ministers in a country of three mm. and a half million people seems like an absurd thing to, um, to have. Um, and you can also see like in the three dots of the presidency that I presented early on, the fact that there are three dots and only three there in, you know, in terms of the way that the presidency is conceived. It shows you that it's done within the logic of the conflict in which mm -hmm. these three were represented in the conflict, were parts of the conflict. The Roma were not part of the conflict, the Jewish population was not part of the conflict, other minorities were not part of the conflict, and they don't get any representation on that high level. So it shows you how much the constitution that Bosnia works with is a, a war constitution, it's not a constitution for the organization of a um, unified country. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a very interesting uh, reminding of what happens there. Um, thank you all for the interesting questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Al. Well. <laughs>